How do you read great works of literature, imaginative literature and fiction? I get asked this question quite a bit, usually by readers who already have certain other types of reading nailed. Most people know how to read some popular fiction, an easy story, just entertainment, isn't it? Just easily digestible. And a lot of people even know how to read textbooks or read non-fiction, self-help, for example, a good uh, self-development book will have practical um, advice for whatever you want to learn and then you can apply it. But when it comes to these great big uh, books like Tolstoy's Anna Karenina or War and Peace, books by Proust à la Rochelle de Tempédou, and when it comes to plays by Shakespeare, grand epic narratives, grand epic poems, uh, indeed smaller lyric poetry, poetry by the Romantics like Shelley, a lot of people come up a bit nonplussed and I'm not surprised because although we do have literature classes, uh, in our educational system, we never have a class or a series of classes that teaches you how to read, which is no surprise because universities also demand that you write essays but never teach you how to write an essay. So let me tell you how I read, how I recommend you read great works of imaginative literature, and here are a few tips to keep in mind. The first thing you might want to do is ask yourself if you actually want to read the book. I think more people tell themselves that they want to read Proust, Shakespeare, Tolstoy, Austin, Cervantes, then people, then there are people who actually want to read the book. Do you want to have read something or do you want to actually read it? Because the two things are quite different. A lot of people want the accomplishments of other people or they want the accreditations, they want the experience, but they don't want to do what the other people have done to get there. So some people might like the idea of being able to say, I read Homer, I read Tolstoy, but they don't want to put in the effort and the work to do so. You have to reconcile yourself to the fact that this is difficult. There is a difficulty with these big books and there's a difficult pleasure. Harold Bloom talked about the reader's sublime. It's like a runner's high. Uh, if you do something that takes a lot of effort, like climbing a mountain, the reward is there during the process, during the journey, and then afterwards. Uh, most people who've climbed mountains, ran marathons, they actually want to have done the running and the climbing themselves, not just say that they've done it. So make sure you actually want what you're saying you're gonna undertake. So a lot of people will come to these great books and they'll try to read them as fast as possible. They'll try to speed read Proust, they'll try to inhale Tolstoy, and then they miss the point. And this is understandable, because to be honest, if we talk about traveling, and Pascal talked about this in his Pensee, if we talk about traveling, if, if I said to you, you can go to all these different countries, see all these monuments, all these galleries, but you can't talk about your travels to another living soul from now to the day you die, not even once, would you still travel? Now, some people would say, oh, hell yeah, for the experience that it gives me myself, even if I can't communicate that with other people, I would still want to do that. If you're one of those people, then reading is for you. And if you're gonna do it, then you do it properly. How do you do it? Well, the first thing you do with imaginative literature, great literature, is you slow down. You slow well down. I know how to speed read. There is an art to speed reading, there is utility to it, but you don't speed read the great books. You slow well down. And remember that rereading is better, superior to reading. That first read is just an initial touching upon the themes and preoccupations, an initial meeting with the characters that populate the world. And a side note, befriend the characters. That's good advice. When you go into a novel, befriend the characters, take their preoccupations on as though they were your own, endlessly think about them. Let them live rent-free in your head. Um, in Nabokov's lectures on Russian literature, he said that older Russian people, they talk about the characters of Anna Karenina, Vronsky, Anna, Levin, Kitty, Dolly. They talk about them as though they were real friends they once had or old acquaintances. Indeed, if you read that book properly, and if you're part of the Anna Karenina book club lecture series upcoming, um, if you're not, sign up in the newsletter link below. If you follow along with that, we are going to get to know these psychologically complex characters better than you know people in your real life, your friends and family. And whilst doing so, you get to know yourself. What is the value of great literature? What do, what do these great books give us? They allow our consciousness to expand. That's the value of great literature, that we can live a thousand lifetimes in once. Indeed, we change a lot over the course of our lives, but we're very lucky if we can perceive even one, two, three of these changes, 
and you certainly can't perceive them as they're happening. I mean, unless you've gone through something extremely traumatic and had a lot of event and experience compressed into a tight space, you can't really perceive change. It's only when you look back over years or just say you meet a friend who you used to go to high school with and they're the same, but they act differently around you because you've changed. Books, great books, allow you to change. So make sure that you choose your books carefully. Now, it's, it's a shame. Not all books can be great books and there is a snobbishness. There is an elitism to this idea. And when Harold Bloom called J.K. Rowling and Stephen King slop at first, I thought, oh, these are, the, these are the books of my childhood. And I was a little bit hurt, angry and offended. But then if you spend a year or two years reading the great works, reading Shakespeare, reading Austin, and then you try to return to works that are artistically inferior, that doesn't mean they have no utility, it doesn't mean they don't offer joy and pleasure, it doesn't mean that I, I dislike them. When you return to them, you do realise that they don't do for you what more nourishing art does. They don't expand your consciousness. At the very best, they give you a little bit of escapism. But we don't want escapism. That's not why we read the great books. We read not to escape life, but to make it more colourful, to understand it and connect with it deeper. And good reading is like good living. If you let the characters live in your mind, if you unpick their concerns and you think about them, you talk about them with other people and you reread endlessly, you'll start to figure out the big preoccupations about life. Rilke said that you must learn to love the questions because questions are answers and good reading You'll go in searching for an answer to a question and you'll throw up three more questions. And indeed, if you read something like Anna Karenina, what are the questions? Well, it's how men and women can understand or misunderstand each other and why, how we communicate with ourselves and others more effectively. That book read properly will sharpen your skills of empathy and improve your communication, not just with others, but with yourself, which is really important. It will try to answer the questions of meaning of life. What is it? Where can we find it? Um, and that's not for me to say because everybody will come away with a different answer. A good work of art is a mirror up to yourself. So why read? Well, why get to know yourself better? That's what it comes down to. Good reading is good living and it's good thinking. It's good considering and it's communication and it's communication across time and cultures and climes. It is a transference of hopefully sincere experience made for the betterment of mankind. People wonder if art has a social utility. Well, funnily enough, I believe in art for art's sake, but I don't think that cannot exist in harmony with this idea of art having a social utility, because if you expand your consciousness, you develop and you become better and you change the world by changing yourself, if you believe that, then art has a strong social utility. So you also want to read over your head. Make sure you're choosing the right books. Not every book can be a great book, but you want to read slower and you want to reread endlessly. So by necessity, you cannot have never ending TBR to be read lists. You can't read frivolously and you can't read everything. If you read continuously from now to the time that you died, you still wouldn't read everything that's deemed great or is great for you. So you want to go searching for those books that you can reread endlessly. Um, because you'll get so much more out of rereading than just initial touch points across many books. So make sure that you choose the right books. And that's not for me to say, though maybe I will say at some point. Um, but you want to read over your head. If you find that you need to reread out of necessity, or if you find yourself getting lost, that's a good thing. Read over your head because that's how you expand your consciousness. And you want to treat these great books like Easter egg hunts. So when you read Proust and he mentions a painting, or a piece of music, or he mentions a word you don't really understand because it's from a different culture and time. Don't just glide over it. You can glide over it, and that's one way to read, and I have read like that before, but that is not a nourishing way to read. You need to take your time and go down the rabbit holes and try to find other hook points on. That's how you start expanding your consciousness and start thinking out. And that's how that book ends up becoming more embedded in your consciousness. And that's how you bring your experience to bear on the work. It's called synoptic reading, where everything you have thought about before, everything that you think you know about yourself and the world and other people, suddenly is hyper relevant to what lays before you on the page. 
And as you start to read deeper, more widely, and you start to read better books, you want to try to bring more of yourself to the work. And you want to read with your three brains. You want to read with your brain, you want to read with your heart, and you want to read with your gut. Now some might say there's another brain, do we need to read with that one? I don't know, that's a topic for another day. But try to read robustly with all of yourself. Another thing you want to do is to respect the unity of a work. How do you do that? Okay, so if you have a poem, you want to read it in one sitting, or as close to as possible. Short story, one sitting, or as close to as possible. A play, a Shakespeare play, which actually can be read, you don't have to see them performed, but you should read them aloud, one sitting, as close as possible. And once you've done it in the one sitting, you return to it again and again and again. You can't do this with big novels, like Anna Karenina, the lecture series that I mentioned, that's going to take place at least over eight weeks, but probably more. There's eight parts to that novel. Each part's about 100 pages, 100 pages a week. That's slow enough, I suppose, if you give it careful consideration, but you could go slower. I'm reading Proust this year, and I'm trying to read all of him in this year, and I'm starting to think that might be too fast. You might want one volume of that work per year, yeah? Slow it down, err on the side of slowing down. Because when you go traveling, just say you have 14 days to go travel. Would you really compress 14 countries into 14 days? Some people do, and they miss the point. I would much rather have 14 days spent in one country, maybe two, slow down, living like a local and taking it all in. And that's what you wanna do with your reading. So respect the unity, reread, Read over the long haul, but also read in single sittings. You should be reading poetry every day. You should be reading short stories as often as possible. Essays. Um, and you should be dedicating months to long works that get you immersed in the world. So choose your books wisely. And remember that choosing to focus on one thing is choosing to ignore another. That's the great thing about reading. If you're busy reading, if you're reading Proust for an hour in the evening, or you get up early and you read Tolstoy, for 30 minutes, what are you not doing? In those 30 minutes, you are not looking at news, hate-filled news articles, politics, political problems. Um, you're not having arguments. You're not neglecting your brain. You're not you know, stewing in banal entertainment. I mean, I do like some fast food type entertainment, stuff that's not nourishing to the spirit or soul, and it's just frivolous entertainment. But in the moment that you're choosing to spend time with a work and consider it and slow down and journal and write and think about it and talk to other people, you're doing something positive, therefore you cannot be doing something negative. It's good for you. Now, when you choose to go to the gym, you're, choo you're actually choosing not to stay sedentary. When you choose to make a healthy steak and a nice big salad and some fruit, you're choosing not to ha go to McDonald's or uh, KFC or Burger King. Okay, so remember that at the very least, what you're doing here is swapping in something very positive and swapping out something negative. You can't keep doing the negative things if you're busy doing something positive. So let's start there. And if you need help with reading any of these great books, because in all honesty, having gone through the humanities education, I got a degree in literature and language from Oxford, I spent years in the educational system teaching both sides of the fence. I think the educational system is crumbling in its modern day manifestation and it needs a helping hand. So I'm going to be here and we'll be reading the great books together. Thank you very much for watching. And if you've enjoyed this video, please hit the thumbs up and subscribe.